Uh, today, we are going to have a panel discussion on what I've called as non-official India development goals. The word non-official is very important because no government of any type anywhere has anything to do with it. They are just my creation and my attempt to focus uh, discussion on what should India be looking at? How can India be guided till 2047? There's a lot of talk of 2047. We have never had long run plans and it's time to set long run goals. So I'll make a brief presentation. Let me share my screen and show it to you. Okay, so if I can get it to go up. Okay, so these are non-official India Development Goals 2047. Uh, what's the objective? The objective is to define goals to provide broad guidance for India's development to 2047. Implementation issues to be discussed subsequently. These are just goals. In implementation, we will talk about how to implement agreed to goals. We don't have agreed to goals right now. We just have proposed goals. So there are three. NIDG1, make all Indians reasonably well off. Of course, you have to define what reasonably means, but that's part of the job. I just want to focus on two elements here. One is keep inequalities in check, which is standard, and promote equality of opportunity for all. So I believe we don't have much discussion of equality for opportunity. This is a broad concept. It includes health, education, non-discrimination based on social identities, so that everybody has an equal shot. Young people have an equal shot. They won't all do equally well, but they should have an equal shot. And I also have a goal that is not commonly discussed, provide targeted subsidies as needed. We recognize that India has to have some subsidies. What are those subsidies, how they should be targeted, how they should be implemented is something that we need to discuss. <clears throat> the second goal is new, I believe, completely. We don't have a goal about quality of life at all. I think it's very important to not just focus on economic growth, but quality of life. Now, quality of life is a subjective term and is determined by multiple factors. So here I'm just talking about what government can do. And the notion is that we need three words, effective, efficient, and responsive governance at all levels. That means union, state, panchayati raj, and cities, municipal authorities. Those are the four, and the district government, which is actually not constitutional, but is key in the villages. So all of those five should have effective, efficient, and responsive governance. What do those terms mean? That's partly to be discussed. Uh, the third goal is become leading worldwide economic power. <clears throat> and let's just focus on the first one, become competitive with China, a real competitor, and become a regional leader. So the focus is not that we are ahead now of UK in GDP or in France of GDP or Germany of GDP. And those are small players in GDP terms. They are big players in GDP per capita, but China is big and is a real competitor. And at the end, we have make the rupee an international currency. That's just a matter of pride and also a symbol that we have come alive, that we are on the world stage. Okay. So that's my presentation. Let me stop sharing the screen and let's move to the comments of the discussions. Raghav, I believe you're first. So let's go. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, and uh, to all the viewers, as well as the panel, the discussants and Professor Subodh Mathur. So uh, let me introduce myself first. Uh, I'm Raghav Modi, and I am currently a student of Delhi School of Economics. And before that, I have been uh, a student at IIT Delhi as a B.Tech student in production and industrial engineering. So uh, as Professor has already presented three uh, goals, which he has in mind, uh, I'm going to talk about three things which India needs to do. Uh, 
uh, which are closely related to the goals respectively, but uh, uh, still very interconnected with each other. So first of all, uh, the one of the most important things I need, uh, I feel is that uh, India when got independence was uh, a society which was still emerging from various issues and uh, our parents, our grandparents, they were uh, like, they were very risk averse due to various reasons because the kind of environment at that time, it, if there was at that time. But now uh, a lot of the basic needs of Indian society are uh, societies are solved. Like uh, there's not an issue of drought, no, not an issue of uh, like water sometimes becomes an issue, but it is ma majorly something which is which has been solved. And uh, at least in principle, everybody is getting educated, uh, not practically, but in principle. So uh, it's time we need to focus our energies on uh, like promoting some kind of risk taking. Like uh, uh, as Sir also mentioned that uh, we need to make sure that equality of opportunity exists for everyone, uh, which basically means that everybody should be able to do what they want to do. And uh, for that, I think we need uh, to encourage or to uh, push up our uh, startup ecosystem, which I think has happened recently. And uh, even within that system, we need to push up uh, or encourage things which are focusing on creating things for India. Like uh, we created a lot of big companies and like, let's say last 30 years, but most of them were service uh, service providers, which were basically catering to the needs of uh, the developed world. And uh, uh, most of the IT, IT companies were doing that, but now the times have changed and we need to uh, make sure that the new companies which are coming up, they focus on the needs of Indian society, of Indians living in uh, tier two, tier three cities, or even in the rural areas. And uh, we, that's the kind of, uh, uh, yeah, that's the kind of uh, uh, entrepreneurship we need to focus at. And uh, so basically, uh, if I want, if we need to summarize it, I, I would say that we need to uh, unlock our creative energies and uh, let Indians uh, explore. Uh, now coming to the second thing, which was uh, the second point, which Sir said was related to the quality of life. Uh, and this is uh, uh, less of economics, but more of politics, I think, but uh, uh, a political politics. So uh, I think Indian, whenever there are elections in India, uh, the major focus is uh, always on the national as well as state elections. While uh, what we live on a regular basis is the life we have in our cities, we have the life we have at our local levels and uh, municipal elections are, I, I think the most ignored elections uh, of the country. Like uh, I think uh, if a city, if a city is like city like Bombay is going to elect uh, Mumbai is going to elect seven MPs, uh, I don't think those seven MPs are going to do much of uh, for the city. Like all they have to do is go in, go to the parliament and raise some questions and uh, vote on some bills. The bills are of national importance, not of local importance. But what we live on regular basis is uh, what happens in our cities. Like uh, I think around seventy to eighty percent of the pollution pop problem of pollution is local. Like. Uh, man management of waste, management of water, and uh, a lot of the pollution which cities have, uh, barring a few exceptions like the smog in Delhi, are based out of cities itself. So uh, we really need to focus on local elections. We need to focus on local uh, governance, municipalities, and uh, <clears throat> maybe at, um, I haven't lived the life in village, but maybe at uh, gram panchayat levels at villages. Uh, and instead of uh, putting so much energies in national elections. So uh, that's what we need to do. Basically, some kind of decentralization or an optimum mix of centralization as well as decentralization. So, and uh, uh, it's the fact that Indian cities are bigger than most of the nations in the world just uh, tells about how important this is. Now, coming to the third point, which uh, I believe is uh, again very important, which Sir said is... Uh, uh, like becoming a global power, right? Uh, global economic power. For that, I think, uh, like, I'll just share some some anecdote. Like, I was attending a talk of some very learned person. He said that, uh, like, the powers of the world they are not powers because they do something well, but more importantly, they do, they understand world. Like, uh, if we take the example of China, it is, uh, of course, it is uh, uh, doing innovations on two aspects. One, the major, uh, the most, one which is uniform for the world, like uh, providing, uh, like, 
microchips and semiconductors and the other which is very specific to a certain region like uh, nobody in china is getting a dream dream that november october is the time of diwali in india and we will buy a lot of uh, uh, lights they they know it because they study india well so that's what we need to focus at we need to understand the world well and uh, we need to like not just uh, understand the developed world as i said in the first uh, uh, point that uh, india has created created a lot of things for the developed world it's time we need we also focus on the underdeveloped world we focus on india and like we understand the world in a whole aspect and uh, to again to summarize this uh, uh, we need to make india more accessible and indians more assertive like uh, uh, india more accessible means just means that uh, anyone who wants to work with india who wants to work in india who wants to invest in india uh, we need to be available for them like uh, I, I mean, it's very difficult for a person sitting in USA or uh, sitting in Europe who has the capital to uh, just invest in the Indian stock market. While I think any Indian who has uh, uh, like uh, access to information and has the cap uh, capacity to take risk, uh, they can very easily put their money in the New York stock or stock exchange or any other stock exchange. But uh, for a foreigner to do it in India, for a foreigner to have access to India, visit India, I think it's more difficult than uh, for an Indian to have access to uh, some foreign land. So uh, that's what I think we need to focus at. Okay, thank you, Raghav. I'm not going to reply till the end, if at all, because my point is to listen rather than to talk. I talk enough. So let, let's listen to the next discussion, and that's Vedant. Yeah, I must say, uh, great points, Raghav. And uh, first of all, uh, hi, everyone. And uh, good morning to Subodh, sir. And good evening to the rest of us uh, sitting here in India. So I'll be having some points uh, about all the goals that sir have mentioned, some perspective to share about it. And we can discuss them further. So as we delve into uh, these goals, um, I think that we are presented with a visionary roadmap that extends into India's future, offering broad guidance for our nation's development. So, uh, you know, as the uh, first goal talks about making all Indians reasonably well off. So what I feel is that uh, creating jobs isn't just about numbers, it's about uh, fostering innovation and embracing sectors like uh, technology and renewable energy, where the true engines of growth lie. The transformation of our workforce can't be just, you know, one size that fits all. It must be adaptable, empowering individuals with the skills for a rapidly evolving global economy. Um, also, one of the aspects that um, Sir mentioned during his presentation that often escapes the discourse is the definition of uh, a reasonably paying job. So it's a nuanced metric uh, that requires deeper analysis for sure. And the factors that could be considered are like location, family size, and other contextual elements. The same goal also talks about, you know, the sustained uh, high real GDP growth. So GDP, again, um, is not a solitary indicator, but it's more of a foundational concept. Uh, so let's recognize that our greatest resources are people. So to unlock their potential, we must invest in education, healthcare, and a conducive business environment. So this ensures that our growth isn't just about is isn't just significant but sustainable and also inclusive. So keeping inequalities in check is also another important point. So true equality is not just about equal distribution, as um, sometimes it's misunderstood. So it's also about dismantling the barriers that hinder progress. It's about investing in early education, uh, investing in health, and creating an environment where every Indian, regardless of their background, can dare to dream. Uh, providing targeted sub subsidies as needed, another uh, important point. So sub subsidies are um, not a crutch. They are bridge towards more equitable society. So, But let's not stop at distribution. Let's also focus on investments that yield long-term in returns on uh, education, health, which empowers individuals to stand on their own feet. Um, okay, so now moving on up, uh, to the uh, second blue goal. So it was about uh, improving quality of life uh, via efficient, effective, and responsive governance. 
so uh, you know providing quality public good services efficiently is about efficient governance is it isn't just about streamlining processes so it's more about instilling a culture of accountability so it's about leveraging technology uh, to bridge the gap between government and those who are governed uh, ensuring that the services that are delivered are prompt and equitable the goal 3 talks about becoming a leader worldwide economic power so you know competing with china is not a competition of nations it's a competition of ideas i feel of innovation and of inclusive growth it's about leveraging our uh, demographic dividend not just for ourselves but for the entire region and our engagement with the world should not be transactional i feel it should be transformational it it's about exporting not just products but knowledge and ideas and in return inviting the world to invest in our progress as well the uh, the point about you know making the rupee an international currency definitely a wonderful goal but the rupees internationalization is not just an economic milestone it's a statement of confidence so it's about showcasing that our economy is resilient that our policies are progressive and that we stand ready to you know lead the go- global stage so yeah i would just like to you know sum up all of these by saying that these goals are not mere markers but they are i feel they could be the keystones for uh, you know the upcoming future yeah okay thank, thank you. you vedant we have chandosh uh, he's uh, more senior than the other two so i put him later uh, let's hear from him it's 3 years since he finished his ma so he gets to no be- sir not Three years, just last year. Yes, <laughs> last year. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you are making me too much senior. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead, Chandosh. Thank you. Um, uh, both uh, Raghav and Vedan pointed some very interesting things, and um, I'm sure they have already made me think, and also will make any viewers who view this video think as well. so i was actually taking a few notes as both of you were saying and um, i will first focus on those notes the some comments i have on what both raghav and vedan just said and after that i will um, for my own view point i will present the ppt that has dr mathur shared with us and i will just take a point take a goal and i will share my view point on that so that's the way i have thought about it so um regarding what raghav was saying that um you were saying about promoting risk taking and i also feel that it's a very important thing and the startup culture and one thing and i'm sure that dr mathur will wholeheartedly agree on me on this one that we need startups not in the big metros but also in tier 2 tier 3 cities and not just the major clusters as students of economics we all know that clusters have some advantages things like economics of scale agglomeration effects things like that but we also need startups in tier 2 tier 3 cities and it is possible actually these days because if they can be located properly in the value chain if they can find their place in the value chain because at least in terms of services most of the value chains are global so it's possible if they can find their place in that way so that's my point and local governance that's also very important and actually a few months back i was uh, hearing a lecture on this topic local governance and um, actually some innovations are happening in india as well i mean people are thinking about things like municipal taxes uh, because municipalities in india they constitutionally can't raise taxes from their citizens but it's uh, pretty ludicrous if we think about that because i mean they are the first interface of the government to which we interact and another is municipal bonds so municipal bonds actually um, i think municipal bond is happening in india i have read about it some major cities have 
they have issued their municipal bonds, but they have faced a roadblock. The roadblock is that in case of bonds, actually, I mean, in the global bond market, for example, the global bond market can function only because there are rating agencies like Moody's whose rating everybody agrees on. People agree that they are giving correct rating. But in case of these municipal bonds, it's hard to understand the quality of the bond. So that's an issue that has already people, government has tried to implement in India and has faced some roadblock. So that's another thing. Um, and another point Raghav was saying that innovations need to focus on the underdeveloped world. And I mean, everybody I'm sure agrees on that, but there the issue is that the innovations focus on the developed world, on Europe, America, Canada, not because Indians love Europe, America, Canada, because the people in Europe, America, Canada have money. They can buy things. Most of Indians can't buy things. And till most of Indians can't buy things, I mean, it will be hard to, I mean, industry can be incentivized, but industry can't be coerced to make things for Indians when Indians can't buy those things. So that another point, I mean, it's actually pretty much boils down to uh, one of the goals Dr. Mathur has already put down that, I mean, everybody agrees on that we need high GDP growth rate and high GDP per capita. So it boils down to that basically. And I mean, Vedant, and now these were the points I thought of regarding what Raghav has said and now, so what Vedant has said, I mean, I I found myself agreeing mostly on what he was saying that transformation can be a one size fits all. Um, we need not only process streamlining, but also accountability. And uh, I mean, the competition India has with China is not one of nation, but of ideas and uh, it needs to be not transactional, but transformational. Uh, I would have put it in another way saying that it's not, the world is not zero sum at the end of the day, right? Uh, and we need to get out of that zero sum mentality. The world is a positive sum place. So um, that's uh, what I thought of um, regarding what you two shared and my very little thoughts on that. So. Um, if I may share my screen now. Sure. Um, yeah. Thanks. So, uh, okay. So, I mean, uh, creating jobs, that's an important point. And all of us mostly agrees on, and not only mostly, all of us wholly agrees on that because we definitely need jobs. Um, and, uh, okay, so I have, and here is the issue about tier one or tier two and three cities. Uh, I have already, uh, drawn on that based on Raghav's points. So here is that. And yeah, here is another thing that. I found very important when I was going through the PPT that how many rupees is a reasonably paying job. So, I mean, it's an extremely contentious question um, and also very context specific. So, um, and as already uh, Dr. Mathur has mentioned that we really need data to answer that. And I would like to add just one thing that we don't only need data, we need very high frequency data to answer that this. Because I mean, in India, there are really no high frequency data on this kind of things. I mean, data, they're always five, six, seven, eight years old. I mean, everything has changed. I once went to a village, the village is not there. The village was submerged by the ocean, but it is still a census village. Because it was there when 2000 census was done. It's uh, near Sundarban actually. So uh, things like that. <laughs> so yeah. And 
I mean, economic growth and development. I mean, all of us have read these in our undergrad economics or postgrad economics issues of growth and development. So, and of course, I mean, they are really complements, not substitute. To put it very bluntly. So, and another thing is actually here that you have mentioned that China reduced poverty very quickly because of high GDP growth rates. And that's the truth. But uh, actually, I read a paper by Dr. Prono Bortham, and he has actually made some interesting observations that before China really took off, China, I mean, before that time, it was a very tumultuous time in Chinese history. Things like cultural revolution, great leap forward, famines, people dying. But interestingly, there was quite an investment in things like healthcare and education. And that investment really created the base based on which they could took, they were able to take off that fast. And India... I mean, these are really not my words, but I mean, very people have pointed out, many people have pointed out that after independence, India invested on high quality higher education. We built the IITs, the IIMs, and they were necessary. But there was a kind of a trade-off made that we kind of neglected the primary elementary education to some extent. And we have now corrected our course, of course, but these were just some of my observations regarding this point. And growth rates, I mean, I completely agree with these things. And uh, economic inequalities in check and promoting equality of opportunity for all, that's also very important. Um, and this is the point I think Raghav has already mentioned that for young adults, lack of access to finance pulls back entrepreneurial ambitions. Raghav has already mentioned this thing. So, yeah, I mean, I at least personally agree with these things. I'm just saying that. Um, and I mean, targeted subsidies, the importance of targeted subsidies, as Dr. Mathur has mentioned. I mean, they're definitely needed. And um, one thing I would just like to add that um, before we can provide targeted subsidies appropriately and efficiently, we need a good data infrastructure because how people are without how people are actually doing and without objectively understanding who is better off or worse off, any targeting will be a very, I mean, is always targeting is always a politically contentious issue, but without proper data, it will be much more so. I'm just saying that. So, I mean, pollutions, another point also Raghav mentioned, and I don't think I have much more to add here. Um, and quality of life for all, I mean, yeah. Regarding the issue of quality of life, I think uh, we need not only us who are in this Zoom meeting, everybody in this country needs more discussion, both in terms of theory and practice that what we Indians mean by quality of life. So things like that. That's just what I feel. And public goods that solely needed And yeah, so become leading worldwide economic power. I kind of agree with what Vedant was saying that really, I mean, as I already said that it's a positive sum issue. So we need to understand that. And just as I have already mentioned that the thing is, I mean, it's an interconnected globalized world now. And we really need to understand where we fit in the value chain. Where we fit in the value chain, where we can compete in the value chain. I mean, our software giants, they are not software giants because they made huge innovations in software. 
as i feel the place where they made innovation is in management they understood well where they fit in the global value chain and they played their game there they didn't try to compete with the silicon valley in the frontier innovation place because it wasn't possible frankly they understood that it wasn't possible so that's one thing i wanted to mention and yeah mostly about that thanks okay thank you chandosh tca it's your turn is a learned man here i can call him learned because he's my classmate <laughs> so <laughs> we are both learned men here senior people who have lived through a lot of what you people they are discussing in terms of history so let's hear from him well yeah thanks thank you everybody uh, very interesting observations on uh, subodh's uh, slides and of course i mean it goes without saying that i agree with everything he says because there's nothing there that you can really object to but these are the goals so that's fine that's fair enough the question is how do you get there and uh, we know the ends we don't know the means and that's the problem uh first of first off i must say that it's not very really useful to compare india and china uh in terms of economic outcomes because the systems that we have the political social cultural systems are very very different above all the political system there is very different because it allows the leadership to have a very clear focus in india we can't have that clarity in focus it is necessarily diffused because the fact that governments here have to be elected in a highly competitive environment means that the political parties or those who are competing for power they have to satisfy the needs aspirations uh, goals whatever you want to call it of very different sections of society so you can't like in china say that okay we are getting the beijing olympics so we are going to clear central beijing of all the old houses three years in advance they come and put crosses on your doors and say that at the end of three years you better not be here and of course they take care that they provide them with housing and transportation which is maybe 50 60 miles away but you don't have a choice now the problem in india is it's not a problem the great thing about india is that everybody has a choice and the fact that you have a choice has a very direct bearing on the kind of outcomes that subodh is or goals that uh, subodh is talking about so uh, we shouldn't be comparing india and china what should we be comparing india with so i firmly believe we need to compare ourselves with what we were 20 years ago 30 years ago 40 years ago etc i remember that uh in 79 at least two of you if not three would were not born then in 1979 we had <coughs> the worst drought in 100 years a drought that was worse than even the 65 and 66 drought which came uh, in 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 successive years in the 79 drought in terms of its depth and its width nobody died of starvation absolutely nobody died of starvation and that had never happened in india before even when the british were not here even people if there was a drought in whether in localized pockets or elsewhere people would die and i remember telling some foreign western journalists saying that how come you guys didn't write about this if even one guy had died there would have been headlines and uh, the problem is that success of certain sorts doesn't make news uh but we have had huge successes polio in i mean in terms of health malaria 
feeding people. I mean, yeah, Subho, they were, when we were in college, there was one day in which you would not, you were not given cereals. You had to eat potatoes or something because there just was not enough cereals going around. So we haven't done too badly. Um, as far as say something like education is concerned, we haven't done too badly. Uh, because don't forget, it's a it's a very huge population we are talking about with an unfocused leadership. It's not a focused leadership necessarily. So if now 50% or 60% or 140 million are able to read, write, do some arithmetic, that's a huge, huge increase over what it was 25, 30 years ago and so on. I can go on giving these things. That, I mean, quite apart from the stuff that we can send rockets to the moon and Mars and whatnot. The problem becomes, as I said, uh, how do you get from point A to point B in in each one of the metrics that Sumud has suggested? And my own belief is that the system of political incentives that you have in the country play a very large role in it. Uh, the the Chinese system, for if, if you will, or the American system or whichever other system, their, their, the, the manner in which their incentives for governance are organized are very different from what they are over here. A starting point in India is that the government will provide. So the government is expected to take the leadership role in a huge variety of areas where it doesn't have the competence or the focus to achieve those goals. So one of the things I think which needs to be done to achieve the goals that Subho has talked about is to empower the people to do what they want to do rather than say that you can only do, do those things that we allow you to do. And if I may digress a bit, this has a very interesting history to it, this attitude. It started in the 1870s, when the, in 1860, the control of India passed over to the British crown. And in the 1870s, the Victorian priests started coming here. They found a lot of art practices here, cultural, economic, social practices. They couldn't understand it. So over the next 15 years or so, they persuaded the legislative authorities in India at the national and at the sub-regional level to introduce a system which was the opposite of what existed in Britain. In Britain, you are allowed to do anything that is not specifically prohibited by law. In India, you can only those, do those things which are specifically allowed by law. And this is a huge hindrance in developing individual capacities. Uh, you know, the startups and things, the kind of hoops they have to jump through is not funny. It's because the operating premise in the political incentivization system is that you need my permission to do this. And one of the reasons, by the way, why India has become a fairly good at this IT export kind of thing is because the government wasn't aware of it. <laughs> so they didn't start regulating it for a very long time. So what the buggers didn't know, they couldn't regulate. And I was, in fact, I think absolutely the first one in 1988 to publish a paper saying this is where India's uh, advantage lay. I wrote a paper for ICREA on this. Uh, but anyway, be that as it may, the uh, <clears throat> problem of how to devise a system that gets you seamlessly from point A to point B, that simply hasn't gone away over 70 years. And that is because whenever you do something which is successful, there are 10 guys jumping up and down saying, oh, that this Dalit community didn't benefit that OBC community didn't benefit. Those Brahmins went away with all the thing, you know, all the all the all the benefits of this. People forget that distribution can only happen if the pie grows. If the pie doesn't grow, what are you going to distribute? 
uh, but the political system is such that it focuses on distribution and not on growth. Uh, we need a very serious rethink of the uh, kind of incentives that we have within the political system, which acts as a barrier via the bureaucracy. The bureaucracy is just an instrument. Everybody blames the bureaucracy, but the buck stops with the political system. So whatever goal that we are trying to achieve that requires a very different set of incentives for the political system, for those to be achieved by uh, 2047. So I'll stop there. It's not, uh, it, it, I have digressed a bit, but I, I genuinely after 40 odd years in journalism, this is what I have seen, that the best ideas get stymied because some guy doesn't want it, you know. Just one chap has the power to stop good ideas. That's an extraordinary thing. And uh, it happens at every level. It happens to the collector in a district. It happens to the uh, secretary of a department in a state. And it happens to everybody at the central minister in the central government level. We are very good at blocking. So I'll stop there. Okay, Thanks thank you. Work. Thank you. Uh, I will just make one response, okay? Then we can have a little bit of time for discussion. And that is that we are talking more about implementation now. Okay? And I agree with it. Yes. Because I'm just trying to really first set the goals and not today or until the end of November talk about implementation. <laughs> My goal is to talk about implementation only beginning in December. I did write the book 20, India 2047 and it talks a lot about not a lot. It talks a fair bit about implementation. And I will just mention one point from that book here, which relates to risk taking. The risk taking is actually a function of an ill-functioning financial system. Okay. And this is our same problem for the finance for the startups. We don't have a good financial system. A good financial system figures out how to let people take the level of risk that they are capable of taking given the reward. So you need to separate the risk takers from those who are risk averse and give them equal a chance at it and give them appropriate rewards. We don't have the financial instruments or the financial system. And that is why our startups keep going to other countries to look for foreign money for venture capital. And they actually become owned by outsiders like Paytm is probably a Singapore company owned now, HDFC, and ICICI are foreign owned companies because we don't have the risk of capital. So financial system stinks, let's put it this way. And in the second thing is I would say, I agree with the TCA uh, that we have had a lot of uh, success, but at this age, good is not good enough. When we say it's been not too bad, my answer is good is no longer good enough. We need to be excellent now. We have had 75 years to say not too bad. And I agree with it. In The first chart in my book is on life expectancy and literacy from 1947 to today. And it shows great progress. But good is not good enough. We need to be excellent. Okay, let me stop here. I don't want to comment. And by the way, I like the term accountability, which is missing from my uh, EER. It should be EERA. Uh, responsive and accountable. Okay, so we need to add that term there. It's a very useful to hear the whole discussion because focus is on how do we get there, and that is the next set of things that I want to start writing about. Till then, I'm willing to listen to everybody. So, okay, we have about ten minutes before uh, we end this. So let's open it to anybody who wants to make any point. It's open discussion. Well, I just want to say that I, I'm not saying good is uh, good enough. We, we have a long way to go, I agree. I'm merely saying that uh, using China as a comparator where uh, the leadership is very much more focused than ours is probably not very, a very good way of going about it. We can devise our own uh, ways of doing it. And also, you know, for example, I, I also happen to think that it's wrong to talk about India 
in when we are discussing these things. We have to talk about uh, separate states because Kerala, for example, has a very high literacy rate, 100%, but a very poor industrial growth rate. Bombay, on the other hand, where Maharashtra, on the other hand, it's the opposite. They don't have much of a literacy rate, but they have a very high industrialized industrialization rate, ditto for Gujarat. So we have to be careful there. Uh, the goals of Sugo are unexceptionable. Absolutely. I mean, nobody can okay, disagree uh, with We, we are moving so, to implementation issues, but I don't want to talk more because I talk too much. So let me shut up. Let's have the young people talk. Yeah, let's let the young people talking what they think. Yeah. So go ahead. There's no order. Just speak. We can speak all simultaneously also, if you like. <laughs> we can shout at each other as on Indian TV. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Raghav. You, Chandos, you have something to say. I mean, no Bengali is ever silent. Okay, let's have. Don't live down your reputation. <laughs> no, I was actually. I'm quite discovered if all of us start speaking simultaneously. To avoid that, I thought of to start speaking. So, I mean, uh, what Raghavan sir just mentioned. I mean, he. Um, put the whole discussion in the perspective of implementation and that's very important, definitely. I mean, we can discuss all types of theoretical issues, but that doesn't matter. That, that of course matters, but that doesn't matter at the end of the day, if I can say so. So, I mean, yeah, the political economic considerations, so to say, they are huge and in that respect, India and China aren't quite comparable. So what Raghavan sir already mentioned. Um, but I think uh, regarding learning from China, um, it's just what I think that we can definitely learn one thing from China that I've also already mentioned before that how to position yourself in the value chains. That I think we can learn from China because I mean the growth that China achieved it was to a very large extent because they were able to build places like Shenzhen and those clusters and they were able to bring the American industries to build their so I mean it's not like copying but how they did it I mean special economic zones they have been an idea and some implementations in India since forever but mostly they haven't worked here so mm -hmm. and that's one respect where I think we have much more to do both theoretically and practically that how to position ourselves in different value chains manufacturing service and different industries they also differ drastically so things that's one point that i wanted to raise okay great let's have vedant or raga yeah uh, sure so uh... I mean, great discussion. And throughout the discussion, I had this, uh, you know, question or let's say an issue that was coming to my mind. Uh, so generally in the economic theories, we have, uh, you know, always heard about this trade-off between uh, sustained high GDP growth and uh, also maintaining uh, the inclusive development. So like, I would like to listen from all of you. Like I also thought of some points and they were majorly... Uh, that sir has also mentioned uh, in his presentation about targeted social uh, programs, about infrastructure development, about fostering entrepreneurship. But these are all uh, seem to be, uh, you know, more of a theoretical points, but I would like to know your viewpoints about, you know, how more practically we can ensure that there is a high GDP growth and, uh, you know, sustained uh, inclusive development as well. Well, Especially I'll tell you my answer on that. Yeah. My answer on that is implicit in the goals. 
that is you have to have development of tier two and tier three cities. Uh, that Without that, you will never get the equality because otherwise the model is that the people leave the villages and go to live in slums in big cities and hope that their children will have a better life. That's the current economic model. And it bypasses the entire, uh, you know, you get Kolkata, Asansol, Durgapur, you get Mumbai and Nagpur and Pune. You get these large city developments, the cities become unsustainable, then you try to create smart cities to solve the problem. But actually that's not the solution I would aim for. I would say, yes, industry and GDP growth will come from the big cities, but we also need to get GDP growth from agriculture, which we are badly lacking, and from small cities. You know, we've, I mean, Raghav, Raghavan and I have lived through food short India. You can't imagine what it was like today when we are exporting rice. We were waiting for rice ships to arrive so that there would be enough rice. That was the situation. We were waiting for a food ship to dock. We would celebrate when a food ship docked because there could be distribution of foods. It was a very different India. We are not there. But we are still going to have the problem of include and equality of opportunity. That's my focus on inclusive development because you don't want, what do you want it to be inclusive about? You want it to be inclusive first and foremost about opportunity. So if you are the child of a Narega couple, I mean, what equality of opportunity do you have? None. Okay, you have no education, you have no health, you have no nutrition, no role model, nothing, right? And you are expected to be reasonably well off by 2047 based on what? Based on what? Nothing. Yeah. So you are now, you are growing an underclass of people and you are saying, well, you know, the poor are holding down India's GDP per capita. Well, obviously, because they are not producing anything. You have 40% of the population in the villages producing 15 to 20% of the GDP. So you are not having that. So inclusive means, you know, leaving this, uh, just focusing on FDI, large cities, smart cities, industrial, celebrating that Apple is going to make iPhones in India, kind of an obsolete thing anyway. <laughs> you know, in manufacturing terms, it's not like new technology. But we need to focus on all of India to have inclusive development, not just on large scale manufacturing software. Yes, we need all that. We need the emerging technologies. We need to be in pharma. Otherwise, we aren't going to get anywhere, but not at the neglect of these other options. And as some of you know, I'm actually looking to get some development in some small town. Chandosh is working with me. <laughs> so I'm trying to live by my words that look, Inclusive to me means, look, let's look at tier two cities. Let's look at tier three cities and see what output we can create there. So anyway, enough from me on that. And uh, Raghav, it's your turn, I think. Before, before that, Subodh, I just have to say, thing, you know, you said something very important, which is nutrition. And I, you should, I think, perhaps devote an entire uh, sort of one hour discussion uh, on nutrition because it is mind-bogglingly poor in India. Yes, it's 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 you know when it's the most neglected subject. But the fact of the matter is that ninety percent or eighty percent of Indians have, on whichever scale that you measure the IQ thing, of IQ comes out to be less than or just about ninety. We have these are borderline idiots. So yeah, you know the, the, we're talking of nearly a billion people like this. I agree. You know when I tell people that thirty percent of Indian children are stunted, and people don't believe me, they say no, 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 it can't be. I said, look, you don't look, you don't know where those people are because you don't live with them, you don't know them. But yes, I agree. Anyway, I don't want to keep talking, so let me shut up. But, uh, yeah. Otherwise, I, you know, I'll never stop. Okay. I, I must say I'll leave in I must leave in three minutes. So yes, I know. Yeah. That's okay, why I'm trying to shut yeah, up yeah. so that he can yeah, leave. Yeah, 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 yeah. Agar. Uh, okay, so uh, since uh, Sir uh, Subodh Sir said that uh, it, there has been enough talk about implementation when it, it was not wanted, so I I would like to reiterate a point which Subodh Sir has. Uh, 
spoken in some of his previous videos and probably it did not come up today is that uh, we need to like ignore the indices which are created right uh, i think you said you said some in some videos uh, like uh, <clears throat> uh, like the indices which are created by different organizations because uh, we don't need to understand the country from perspective of others we need to understand india well like you said that we don't know who are the people uh, the, the 30 percent stunted kids where where are they we, we don't know them because we don't live with them and that's precisely where we are going wrong we need to understand the country well we need to live with these people we need to like uh, uh we need to like the person who are who is responsible for this like the collector or the uh, chief minister of the state and even entrepreneurs need to understand what what are the nuances of different regions and uh, uh, like i would in the last i would say that we don't need a leader we don't need a prime minister or uh, any any leader of that sorts who is uh, trying to create a india of his vision but we need somebody who is uh, trying to cater to the needs and demands of the people he is responsible for okay well okay let's thank uh, raghavan he has to go uh, just was, one last point about yeah, this stunt he goes right do you know 65 to 70 but at least i am more successful but, in stopping yeah, I just stop. Is it, I just wanted to point out a number: sixty-five to seventy percent of the stunted children are women. Yeah. I mean, this shows yeah. that it, what Amartya Sen has been saying for forty years that uh, Indians deprive their girl children of food. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. So Bye. anyway, on that yeah. very yeah. happy note. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Okay. Good. Thank you. Bye. All right. All right. So we can continue, but let me just uh, say a couple of things. Uh, from my book, that is uh, one thing the book clearly says the role of the prime minister is overhyped. Okay. Prime minister is given too much power, much depends upon the cities and the states, right? And so the chief ministers need to be more accountable. Uh, and as you said, we live in cities which are run by municipalities, and the municipal authorities have no power and no accountability whatsoever. So we just have rotten quality of life in the cities. And then the union government comes along and starts a smart cities program. Well, but the smart cities program is not run by the municipal authorities. It's selection by the union government, money from there. That is not an organic way to have a better quality of life. Anyway, I think for me, the main con one of the main contributions is to put quality of life as a national goal. Rather, it's not something that has been discussed, but it's about time that we figured it out. And the role of the government, for me, you know, there's a lot of muddle in thinking about the various goals and implementation. So I've tried to separate out implementation from the goals and clearly list the goals so that we can then think about how to get there. So that is really my effort in this. And to put, you know, efficient, effective, responsive, and accountable governance at all levels. Because without it, you can keep having GDP growth. But, you know, Bangalore is like living in Bangalore is like living in hell because you can't go from one place one to place two. It is not a joke. And living in Delhi is hell because the air is bad, right? So, you know, all the big cities that are creating the GDP growth, life is hell. It's not a joke at all. So where is this GDP growth getting? Anyway, I don't want to talk much because I will begin to write and think about implementation. Uh, there's a lot in my book already, but I need to rethink it <clears throat> because that book was more about reducing the how to get rid of the barriers to growth. And in a way was trying to say, listen, if we reduce the barriers, the people can do it. You reduce the barriers for the and unleash the creativity of people, then they can do it. So that point still remains valid, but I think a little bit more proactive thinking. And now I do have the support of many people who can help me think and write because it's a tremendous task. But I don't think I can really make very detailed discussion. So I probably will have a thinking to write some details on how to get. And of course, the implementation will not just affect one goal at a time. One, like education, will give you 
equality of opportunity. It will also give you GDP growth uh, and so on, you know. So we need to feed into each other. Anyway, that's all I want to say. I want to thank all of you uh, for being here with me. I will have a couple of more discussions on this issue, the same topic. A lot of people can't do it on a weekday, so I'll have one on a Sunday. And then the timing is different for people in Europe and USA, so I will have a separate one for them. Okay. Any points from you? I, you know, I have to stop talking. I have to learn to stop talking. <laughs> Good. So let's be quiet. Let me be quiet. Let's listen. Any comments from you? If not, I don't it, have any comment. Just okay, good. To mention that. All right, good. All right. Vedant Raghav, any comments? I mean, you uh, are I'm India's leading professor. people in the economics field. You know, you are not professors, but you are top students uh, from reputed universities. So we need to hear from you. Uh, the, the for, unfortunately, the system which I'm trying to break through my wit pads is such that it doesn't give the young people an opportunity to become you know, aware that they too can have views and opinions and they too can talk. So this is part of my effort to actually break that stupid system. Like, look, you don't allow young people and, and then you tell them that you are the future of the country. Say, so what is the future when I can't open my mouth? <laughs> anyway, sorry. Okay. Any fast last words? Yeah. So uh, the point that you mentioned about, uh, you know, chief ministers uh, should be given more authority as they are more, uh, you know, they have more responsibility. Actually, they don't need more authority. Chapter two of yeah. my book lays out the powers of the chief minister in the constitution. Okay. And it, li it lists the current, uh, uh, the concurrent subjects and the state subjects. They don't need more authority. They may need more funds, but they are supreme. They are totally supreme. Mamta Banerjee kicked out Tata, <laughs> you know, yeah. or the invited Tata. The government of India had nothing to do with it. Okay, So they are supreme. They run the show. They don't need more authority. It's just that we think they don't have enough authority, but actually they do have enough authority. And you just take a look at what uh, the chief minister of Odisha, Naveen Patnaik, is now the sec second longest running chief minister. The first one, I think, is in Sikkim. But of the large states, he's the longest running chief minister. And he's re-elected every time. And nobody can beat him because he's delivering to the people. He's, you know, on the day that Air India was buying 550 planes, uh, he handed over the electricity sector in Odisha to Tata. That was much bigger news. But nobody knows that because, you know, he doesn't play to the press. He doesn't play to the public. He can barely speak Odia too. <laughs> he lived, his father was famous, but he wasn't. But still, he's not a great orator. He just, so why is he re-elected? He's re-elected because he's delivering. Okay. So every chief minister has to have, they have the power. And by the way, that power came from the liberalization of 1991. It's the least understood aspect of the liberalization of 1991, that by giving no more authority to central planning, by removing all restrictions, most restrictions on licensing, location, etc., uh, the power basically shifted to the chief minister's economic decision making. And that's why you see this tremendous divergence in the growth rates of different states in India. So the power has shifted to the chief ministers. And it's not just shifted to the chief ministers, it's shifted to the powerful people in the state. Uh, you know, the Bal Sahib, Baba, Bal Sahib Thakre is a key figure in Maharashtra. <clears throat> uh, long ago in 2000, when Enron was setting up a power plant in India, they didn't bribe him. They went and bribed other people whose names I don't want to mention. <laughs> but he said, listen, I run this place. And unless you can tell me that this is good for my people, it's not going to happen. And when he said it's not going to happen, it wasn't going to happen. Okay. So, 
There's a woman who can look her up, Rebecca Marx. She was a senior person in Enron. And he said, she has to come to my home to explain. I don't go anywhere. And by the way, you can't come in Western clothes to my home because I live in a middle-class locality. <clears throat> so she went and explained it to him and came out and he said, now I understand that it is good for the people of India, Maharashtra and Mumbai. And I say, it's okay. It was the most disastrous project. As you know, it died very fast and very soon. It was a terrible project, but he had been duly compensated. So they actually bribed their union minister for power. <laughs> and he said, what is this? I run the show here, not the union minister of power. He sits in Delhi. What's this going on? So the power is with the chief ministers already. There's nothing to say. Oh, they may not have enough funds because, uh, and this is the issue of central state federalism. How much, how the money should be shared, the finance commission for us economists, how the money is shared, how they can raise taxes and so on, the GST share. Or these are key issues for the money that the chief ministers have. But the authority, that actually the prime minister is very weak. Uh, prime minister is very weak. And it was clear in COVID that the prime minister, after some time, simply said, let the states handle it. Because the, the prime minister doesn't control a single health facility. <clears throat> so what? to whom are you going to give orders? How are you going to implement? Actually, the union government has no implementation authority whatsoever. They keep talking as if they have. You know, they have an aspirational district program, meaning backward districts which must grow faster. But they don't have any staff in that district. The staff are all of the chief minister. There is this perpetual effort to reform the discounts, the power discounts, right? But you have no say on the discounts. None. You can only say, I can give you a cheap loan, I can give you this, I can give you that. But who is appointed to run the discounts is absolutely the chief minister. The schools, which everywhere, all of us have been talking about, they're run by the chief ministers. The union government has no say whatsoever. The health facilities are run by the chief ministers. They have all the say. The union government is actually very weak in terms of implementation, in terms of even uh, making things happen. And as you said, if the even the chief minister is weak, it's the municipalities that run the traffic, the garbage collection, uh, all these things. So, you know, electricity, supply to your home, water supply to your home, garbage collection. Union government has no role. It is actually increasingly clear that they are unable to provide. And that's why the growth rate is not getting up high. Because as Raghavan said, we have to look at our political system. The political system is that the power is in the villages. It's actually with the collector. And in the cities, it is with the chief minister and muddled with the authorities. And industrial, yeah, you need, you have, we have foreign policy and you know, exchange rate and the fiscal policy and all. But in the end, agriculture is a state subject. And has always been. The only reason that it became, because the green revolution of the 60s, the technology was imported and it could only be done through the union government at that time, because it's a foreign technology came in through, not paid, but through the government. And then the government could, the union government had the money, state governments were very poor, so they could decide where the money would be. The subsidies, Punjab, Haryana were deemed to be agriculture, wheat growing and rice growing there. So you give the subsidies. But today, actually, it's the chief minister of Punjab who's responsible for the decline of Punjab. Successive chief ministers, you read that Punjabis are paying large amounts of money to be smuggled illegally to the U.S. Why? So anyway, the power is with the chief ministers. Let's be very clear. And they are sometimes accountable and sometimes not. So the union government is a small player in India's economic future. Let's, I mean, that's my point on Quora since 2019. Wake up, wake up, wake up. It's the PM plus CM, not PM alone. Uh, that's 
point that's clear from my book that whatever issue you look at, you find that the solution lies with the chief ministers. Yes, are they making the rupee an international currency? No, chief ministers don't have. But you look at all of those goals. You say, okay, we must improve education. You know, people tell me that in Bihar, in this district, Darbanga, Lalit Narayan Mishra University, you can't get your BA degree in three years because they don't hold the exams, they don't start the classes in time to finish in three years. Normal student finishes in four and some finish in five because there are no classes, there's no exams. Well, uh, in, so this has nothing to do with the prime minister. The chief ministers who are running this show, who are making it miserable for the people. And the, we really have to think about, and you know, when you look through all the implementation roles, I don't mention the union government at all because the only thing it matters is make the rupee an international currency. The rest of it, if you look very clearly, there's the union government has no staff anywhere. Even the district collectors, they are recruited by UPSC, but they are assigned to the states. Once they're assigned to the states, basically they respond to the chief minister. I mean, I know because I come from a UPSC family. Okay. I'm more than half a Babu. I, all my friends are IAS, IPS, and such stuff. My family is that. So we know who runs the show. The Prime Minister has got nothing to do with you, with your life. You are running the show in your own state. So anyway that's it's all well it's all quite written in my book but i'll make those points again now that we are looking i didn't have these goals there because there my goal was to simply point out what are the barriers <clears throat> and remove those weaknesses but i am now beginning to since think that we should think about goals okay anyway as usual i keep talking but you keep listening <laughs> that's bad <laughs> need to get out of this. All right. So, Raka, any last words from all of each one of you? Last words, please. Okay. If there's nothing, then thank you very much. Uh, it is always uh, good to hear uh, what people have to say and think. Uh, let's look forward to some collaboration in the future. Okay. So, let's end the recording here. Bye, everybody. Bye.